your kind presentation. Good afternoon to you all. I would like to thank Tassar Garzon just for this conference, which is really timely, and which is a good replacement of the denial that has been given to the um, to participate here of the bodies that took part in the amendment of the law regarding the judicial uh, universal jurisdiction. So he is the maximum representative in terms of international justice. So I'd like to give an overview. I'm afraid that I will be a bit more boring than the rest of the participants here. I would like to tell you what happened in the last 18 years that we've been fighting for universal jurisdiction. I will be brief, and I will share with you the lessons learned and then, well, the unmet needs so far. So, well, first of all, we have to say, it must be said that human factors should be there. In, the, in our case, I was one of the youngest people in the uh, team of lawyers. It would not have been possible if we didn't have uh, great lawyers very with a wide understanding of criminal criminal law and who and who all advocated for human rights. Juan de la Bella Casa Almudena Bernabeu, Maite Parejo, Jose Elias, he has given a talk this morning. But also judges and prosecutors that were committed, that were very much believed what they've read. They believed in constitution and they believed in international right, in law. Uh, Garzón, judge, I'm sure that if it were not for him, this conference would not be taking place today as well as many other cases, cases regarding universal, universal jurisdiction. Juez Pedreo, Ricardo de Praga, and many other chairs that were given the support from abroad, and many others. What was the first thing that we realized? Well, in all these cases, and at least in the cases that I took part and I'm still participating, we said that they are severe, severe international crimes that were just that were not being punished, and of course that it affected uh, and, and damaged the core of human rights. I can remember the charges or the situation of the Saharawi people when we were presenting it to, uh, uh, to Baltasar Garzón. So the killings, the torture, the bombardments of Nepal and the deserts and many, many, many other things. And all those facts shared a common thing that were generalized and systematic against the civil society. And that on the other hand, that the end or the purpose for committing those crimes was just extermination of the peoples. In this case, the Saharawi peoples from Guatemala, Mayan uh, peoples, you name it. So we, in the face of the situation, we thought what happened with the universal justice. It was not developed at that time. We considered what was a war crime, genocide, international criminal law. What was that of enforcement of the principle of lawfulness within international law? But one of the things that we discovered, that was the first big lesson, that above the laws that have been uh, but laws that we have nowadays, we had international law that the Spanish constitution ensure the enforcement or the application of international law and international treatment. And that international law was saying that you, can, you cannot enforce an internal law that goes against the international law or treaty. So we also learned that there were crimes of different nature, that there was a difference between corruption uh, and um, genocide. And that was that was setting the principles of universal jurisdiction. So not all the crimes fell within this uh, this uh, the definition of universal jurisdiction. We also learned that some crimes, despite some qualifications that we could make, such as uh, war crimes, genocide, etc., had to be prosecuted. Be that there were crimes because they were decided by both in international law and could not be subjected to any link whatsoever, any connection whatsoever. That we cannot really accept to have a person who have committed genocide being sitting here with us today because he hasn't got Spanish nationality. We cannot afford, we cannot really um, um, 
uh, tolerate that he cannot be prosecuted. As Almudena said, we learned from the Guatemala conviction, and at that time, we could really refer to pure universal jurisdiction. It is not because it was made up by the judges or by the prosecutors, but just because he was stated, it was stated under international law. So when we went to the law school, we could see, well, all the conventions, all the treaties tell us that if a state parties commit themselves to uh, apply it, to enforce it, why shouldn't be prosecuted? Why it should not be, uh, be we had learned that it was Cuscoyen crimes that that they had to be prosecuted. We also learned that these crimes could not be uh, prescribed. And then we also learned that the statute of the International Criminal Court, that instrument that consolidates international law, had said to the whole international community, and not only to parties, that, that it was the duty of all the states to exercise universal jurisdiction against the, all the perpetrators of these crimes. We also learned that there is not there is a supra state universal for the defense of human rights. And we could see that the higher the number of instruments, so universal declaration of human rights, international treaties, more and more crimes were being committed, um, more perpetrators were going unpunished. So we could also realize that the international law was over and over again breached. And at that time, that we also could see that juris universal jurisdiction had a lot to say that many victims in the world, Tibet, Sub-Sahara, Sahara, etc., were not offered that uh, justice, and that states were all the time breaching the international obligation to investigate, to sanction, to prosecute, and to offer remedy of repair. We also learned that impunity laws were up there, and that that laws had never been had never been promulgated because they were going against international law, amnesty law pardon laws and the law on due obedience. So we also learned to set the principle of competence. So that is to say, so that they didn't pull our leg, so that we here in Spain weren't being told that we couldn't prosecute from Spain because the uh, person was also being prosecuted in other place. So well, we could see that in these other countries, he was taking years and years, and, because, and that the necessary conditions were not being met to prosecute that person in that country. And what happened with those countries that did not have the possibility to prosecute those countries that did not ensure impartial or unbiased uh, trials, or in those countries that wanted to enforce impunity over and over again. So we also realized and understood the shortages of investigations, of investigation process. We want to give them a comprehensive international standard. We want the processes to be fulfilled and completed from beginning to end that we wanted to identify the perpetrators. And what is most important, we have defended the victims. We have made their rights uh, available. The big, the forgotten, forgotten victims. In the case of Tinduf, when we used to go to the camps to prepare the witnesses and to accompany them. In the case of Guatemala, we told them that they had a right to justice, to effective justice through the principle of universal jurisdiction. And they, for the first time in their life, they had the right to be treated under to receive protection and to be treated fairly and to prevent re-victimization, which is found very frequently in the victims of human rights, and of course to give them remedy from the justice. Um, I believe that one of the most important learnings, as Almudena mentioned before, we learned that in all the, from all the possible scenarios, the only one that is effective to ensure that impunity can be fought against is universal jurisdiction. We have in International Criminal Court that with many limitations with the competences issues. But we also realized that Spanish legal experts 
do not understand. So, so the case of territoriality and the case law based is is has essential. So it is should be a priority to prosecute some crimes. Crimes. Well, despite what the International Criminal Court does, I defend it and I do whatever it is possible within that limitation. But can, what can we expect from a court that has uh, given uh, 24 sentences, convictions in 21 years only, has carried out seven investigations? So I want an International Criminal Court that prosecutes the US, Israel, China, Spain, and every single country in the world. So we also realize those of us who were working on the universal jurisdiction that the principle of universal jurisdiction was a principle of international law. And as such, it is according to the practices of the states uh, and then it became a source and that we had to do it. We also realized the difficulties in terms of cooperation. I guess that Jose Elias told you about the difficulties in the case of Tibet, Tibet's case and then the letters rogatory that were sent out issued and that received no response to date. In the case of Sahara, we still could not uh, Tell we could not contact the people responsible in Sahara. They just shelved them. And the same goes for the international orders for arrest regarding you know military members, members of the military in the US. We should not forget the high political components in these crimes. Every time one of these crimes is committed in one form or another, it is committed from the states. Well, Professor Maradlo, I don't know whether he is around. He is a colleague from the Lewis Law School. He remembers Kidman's words. He says, a word from a legal expert made the um, the, uh, libraries of jurisprudence useless. Well, I don't think that that will be the case for universal jurisdiction. We've learned a lot from victims, from the mothers of May Square, from many, many, from so many associations of victims and sufferers of those crimes. And we learned something very beautiful from them, that you can really, that law, law allows you to achieve many things. Well, these days, you know, we are fashionable, we are trendy here in Spain, but trending topic because of football, of uh, soccer. So at that time, we had our Cholo Simeone. So Carlos Lepoy helped us uh, win uh, cases, you know, one after another. So we never waited until the end. So unfortunately, that's the reason why we are here today. So we want the cases appeal by appeal, so step by step. So. Human rights cannot be replaced by an economic bill. So they cannot be replaced by, by interest, purely economic interest, as well as commercial interest, as it has been the case for universal jurisdiction. I also would like to mention something, especially to representatives of victims. In the past 18 years, at our national high courts and also in our courts, if we have learned something, well, we have learned how to save situations, how to save proceedings, uh, the worst uh, proceedings that we managed. Thank you so much. It will be broken or terminated, as has been the case in other places in the world. So, Manuel, tell us about the contradiction of the attitude of the national high courts that defends, on the one hand, universal jurisdiction, and on the other hand, denies it. Well, actually, this is not a contradiction whatsoever, but just the opposite. I'll give you two examples to illustrate what I say. Case, yesterday's case, which is a ruling Guatemala case continue, agrees to continue with the proceedings of proceedings for the Guatemala genocide based on international law and more specifically according to the new law to prosecute crime of terrorism. For that, the only thing that is needed, the only requirement that is needed, remember the categories of victims that were uh, established here yesterday by Professor Cepeda. So, cause of case. Geneva Convention state that it must be prosecuted. 
and should not be subject to any connections, to any links. I quoted the Geneva Conventions as well as the Spanish law. Coso case moves forward. And the case of Guatemala genocides, they move forward, but qualified or classified as terrorism. And Pedral judge says it very well. We should not forget that what marks the process is not a fact, but a crime. And the crime could have a link to other uh, facts or not, or to a crime. So once jurisdiction on the grounds of uh, terrorism is stated, there is jurisdiction. What happens with drug and drug dealing? Vienna Convention 1988. So our Spanish law and the Geneva Convention state that the alleged uh, accused uh, for, uh, must be Spanish, or the vessel may have uh, should have a Spanish flag, or should be uh, should be travel to Spain. So this he has a facultative power. So if no Spanish mariners or sailors are found, there is no Spanish flag, or the vessel does not come to Spain, there is no jurisdiction. And we are applying the, same, the criteria of international law and internal law. What is the problem? Well, the problem with this law is China is the client, has become the client of Spain. Well, the relevant Chinese person used to call our president every day, set a number of deadlines to him, and I said, well, the law on international uh, jurisdiction has to be reformed. And what did they do? They visited every single court in order to tailor a law to keep China happy, as well as Morocco happy, as well as the US happy. They were not concerned whatsoever about drug dealing. When the proposal was launched, I can remember some of the, well, the Association for Human Rights said, careful, careful with the issue. This is a big issue you are going into. That is a big, big problem. So this actually tells us about the shortages of the law. And at the end of the day, they did what they wanted to do. They did it. They want to remove the protection of human rights and then the right to be defended. So nowadays, the drug dealers that travel, they, uh, that ha have a vessel around close to the Gibraltar Strait, they have a manual. They have a manual that if they follow it, they will receive impunity. So they, they just bypass it. They will bypass it, and nothing. They will not be prosecuted. They will not be punished. Well, perhaps we could refer to the for the for the end. So. So, universal jurisdiction is only applied to the states that are no one or nobody in the international law. Is it, is it that powerful states are using this uh, universal jurisdiction as a way to hide themselves? And then why is there a clear reluctancy on the Spanish left for not supporting the genocide the genocide or the cause that, he, that is investigating the genocide in Tibet and in China. Is it that the victims in China and the Tibet are less victims or lower victims than those in Guantanamo or Chile, etc.? So the first one is addressed to Manuel, the second one is addressed to Joan, but well, any of you could answer as you wish. Well, I was about to answer uh, the two of them in five seconds. Well, the person, well, the first question was, the first answer is that the person who made the question is fully right. And then the second one about the Tibet case. Yes, I still, I, I, I don't know either uh, why that discrimination, if any, is made between the victims of the Tibetan um, genocide and the victim from any other genocide in the world, in Guatemala, you name it. So from the political viewpoint, well, perhaps it escapes me, but there is no justification whatsoever because international crimes against humanity uh, do not understand colors, ideology, or any other thing when it comes to 
But when it comes to defend people, I'm to a fight, I'm to struggle. What can the Spanish government do? After discovering the mass graves in Sahara, do you think that Spain has political will to defend that, considering the agreement in of 2009? And what is the hope for victims if governments cannot do anything? And the last one is from a representative from the Morocco embassy. It is very complex, very long. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to follow it. First of all, says that people that live in the Rift territory, they can also speak Spanish. He also says that universal jurisdiction should not be single-faced. He is also asking enforcement of the people that are being abducted by the Polisari Front. He also asked about the situation of the 500 Mauritanian prisoners in he is asking what can universal jurisdiction do to treat the uh, situation between the Polisari Front and the jihadist groups. He is mentioning the freedom of expression, torture, a poet, Naime Arial, Narime Alil. Uh, sorry, I don't understand his hand handwriting. And then also a journalist of the radio channel, Juni Sereti and Jenei Shlama. How can we stop in the Sahara the selling of slaves on the part of the Polisari Front members? What can we do with the relationship? How can we stop the relationship of Polisari Front and drug dealing? He says that all the fight, all the struggles, carried from the Embassy of Morocco when he put these questions. So I would ask him that to read, to read the international treaties in about human rights. He should cooperate with the cause and the help that he's asking for. Well, I cannot really see who he is. He should cooperate what the, in terms of uh, he should contribute to what has been said about these mass graves. And then they should stop mistreating and torturing the Sahrawi people. I'm sure that they have tortured a Sahrawi person today. I'm sure that they bring uh, oh, sorry, the rights are being violated and breached today. They should uh, stop mistreating uh, the children. They should let them express themselves uh, in freedom. And then they should give them the right to express themselves and the right to self-determination. If they really think that any crimes have been committed against them, they have their own courts. They have their own courts. And the Sahrawi people do not have the courts in the occupied territories. Why is not that prosecuted? Uh, well, they are hiding, uh, they are using impunity. They are judging or they are taking cases to the military course. They are, I would like to say this loud and clear. I don't mind if they breach a case against us. They are constituting evidences, and they uh, they continue to do illegal detention and kidnapping. That's what I would like to uh, say to the representative of the Moroccan embassy. Okay, they should.